Hey everyone. So like I mentioned in class on Tuesday for class on Thursday, September 30th, uh, we'll be doing the class asynchronous, which basically just means you'll watch this video and then complete a journal assignment in response to it. So I wanted to jump right into an excerpt from Aldo Leopold's Thinking Like a Mountain. Uh, and that's what I'll do. And then we'll talk about the reading. We'll talk about who he is, his philosophy, and then discuss the journal. And that will be that. <clears throat> so this comes about two or three paragraphs into the piece, he begins with sort of a philosophical idea of what he's doing with some thick description, kind of explaining where they are and what they're doing. And then he jumps into what actually is happening. So this is the moment of um, where he begins with sort of some abstract ideas and then the piece sort of crystallizes with a description of something happening. He writes, my own conviction on this score dates from the day I saw a wolf die. We were eating lunch on a high rim rock at the foot of which a turbulent river elbowed its way. We saw what we thought was a doe fording the turret, her breast awash in white water. When she climbed the bank toward us and shook out her tail, we realized our error, it was a wolf. A half dozen others, evidently grown pups, sprang from the willows and all joined in a welcoming melee of wagging tails and playful maulings. What was literally a pile of wolves writhed and tumbled in the center of an open flat at the foot of our rim rock. In those days, we had never heard of passing up a chance to kill a wolf. In a second, we were pumping lead into the pack, but with more excitement than accuracy. How to aim a steep downhill shot is always confusing. When our rifles were empty, the old wolf was down and a pup was dragging a leg into impassable slide rocks. We reached the old wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then and have known ever since that there was something new to me in those eyes. So that's from Aldo Leopold's Thinking Like a Mountain. And I'll tell you sort of who Leopold is. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about, well, talk, I'll talk at you a little bit about the reading. So Leopold is uh, a sort of jack of all trades in the world of environmental science. He was born in 1887. He died in 1948. But when you talk about who he was and to classify his position in sort of the world of philosophy and ecology and environmentalism, it's difficult. So you can think of him as an author. Most uh, First and foremost, the piece that you read uh, is very authorial. You know, it's very well written. He clearly has creative writing talent. So he's an author, he's a philosopher, he's a naturalist, a scientist, an ecologist, a forester, a conservationist, and an environmentalist. Um, and that's really not being hyperbolic to say those sorts of things. Leopold was a giant in the field of environmentalism uh, in the early 1900s. He was also a professor at the University of Wisconsin, and he's best known for his book called A Sand County Almanac, the piece I just read to you coming from the larger piece, Thinking Like a Mountain, uh, is, a, is a chapter basically from A Sand County Almanac. So when you think about uh, Aldo Leopold, um, most people think about his piece, A Sand County Almanac. It's still read today in environmental classes quite a bit. And one of the more famous quotes that is uh, sort of related to Richard Louvre, The Nature Principle, and the things we've been discussing this semester is this. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. Biotic was a term they used to use uh, back in the early 1900s. It basically means ecological community. So to say biotic community, sort of think of an ecosystem. So he's saying that like, look, if you want to figure out what's right and wrong, if your actions some way, some way destabilize uh, an ecological system or an ecosystem, then, you know, then it's wrong. It's really quite simple. And it's fascinating that we take that idea for granted, but Aldo Leopold is often credited with that notion. Eventually, what he did is he came up, just like uh, Richard Louvre has come up with sort of a philosophy that he calls the nature principle, um, Le Aldo Leopold's uh, general philosophy is referred to as the land ethic. So as a person, um, he was assigned to hunt and kill bears and mountain lions and wolves in New Mexico. Local ranchers who had, you know, uh, they were raising their cattle, those cattle would be killed by these, these uh, predators. And so they would hire people like Aldo Leopold to kill as many bears and mountain lions and wolves as possible. Um, but over time of doing this, 
Leopold changed his view because he saw the sort of ripple effect of what happens when you start wiping out a particular species from a particular geographical location. And he changed tact. In other words, he changed course. So one day he's hunting and killing bears and wolves and mountain lions. And the next day he dedicates his life essentially to a philosophy of ecology that he ends up calling the land ethic. And the idea of the land ethic is that humans are, is very, are very much uh, attached to the natural world. So there is a sense of Taoism in Aldo Leopold's philosophy. And you'll remember we talked about that in Tuesday's class. Um, it's very much a Western thought, what Leopold came up with. This is how he describes it. The land ethic simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include soils, waters, plants, and animals, or collectively, the land. Now, remember we talked about how Louvre discusses his point of what the natural world is, and then we watched that uh, TED talk by Amanda Maris, I think her name is, and she talks about this really terrible definition that we have of the natural world. People think of the natural world as an area that's untouched by people. If we accept that definition, there is no such thing as the natural world because everything's been touched by people, whether it's physically with their hands or through climate change or some other way. And Leopold was sort of ahead of his time because he thought of this. He sort of thought of an alternative definition of nature years ago, way before Amanda Maris, way before Richard Louvre, way before all these people. He was one of the first to uh, coin uh, what we would coin today as a non-anthropocentric conservation philosophy. So when you say anthropocentrism, what that means is thinking of humans as the most important thing. So if you think, uh, you know, if you say like, um, the, this study is very anthropocentric. What it means is that it focuses on humans and holds humans higher than everything else. He was the exact opposite. His philosophy is very non-anthropocentric. So what he's saying is, look, humans are no better than a wolf or a bear or, uh, you know, or a, or a trout or a salmon. We're as much part of the ecological system, the natural world as anything else. The fact that we evolved with a giant brain that we can sort of use it to our advantage uh, and at this point in 2021, you know, destroy it, um, is, it doesn't mean that we're better than it. You know, some people make the argument it actually shows that we're a little bit uh, worse. You know, ecosystems tend to carry on with their own volition for a long time. We've come in and sort of, you know, uh, cranked the balance uh, so rapidly and so quickly that anthropocentrism is, is sort of a, takes on a negative connotation nowadays. It used to just mean in scientific journals, it just meant, you know, human focused or human centric. Now, when you say it, it can be used as a derogatory term. He's the opposite. He's non-anthropocentric. So the land ethic, um, Leopold shifted conservation away from focusing exclusively on humans, which is the way it looked before. So ecology was always, and conservation was always about, okay, let's take care of the world, but let's make sure that no matter what happens, humans are as comfortable as possible. We don't want to put out people or make them do extra work because you have to remember in the thirties and the forties, the idea of, you know, climate change and how our actions will affect the world was not necessarily accepted as science. So, you know, there was this idea that you could do whatever you wanted, but we should probably pay attention to the natural world as well. And then, you know, someone like Aldo Leopold comes in and says, whoa, 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 whoa. We need to stop thinking about humans altogether um, and think about the natural world as sort of a holistic view. And humans are part of that. You know, we're part of that, but we're not better than it. Right. So he was um, trying to be uh, the, revulse, the, the reverse of speciesism, which is like saying one species is dominant or superior to another. Right. So um, often people say that, you know, humans are very species. We think that we're better than every other species. Now, in some ways, of course, there is a, a, an order of evolutionary, um, you know, uh, intelligence and cognitive thinking and power and all, you know, so I'm not saying that we're on the, the you know, on the same level of ants. Uh, but when you start to think that everything on the planet is there for one species, right? Everything we see under us is there for me. It's just a resource for me to live more comfortably or have a better life. That's sort of the epitome of anthropocentrism and speciesism. So what's Leopold's influence today? I'll give you a quote that I think really sums it up. So Bruce Babbitt, who was the um, Secretary of the Interior, I guess it would have been under Bill Clinton at the time, um, said the following. In 1995, I helped carry a first the, the first gray wolf into Yellowstone. 
where they had been eradicated by federal predator control policy only six decades earlier. Looking through the crates into her eyes, I reflected on how Aldo Leopold once took part in that policy, then eloquently challenged it by illuminating for us how wolves play a critical role in the whole creation. He expressed the ethic and the laws which would reintroduce them, reintroduce them nearly a half century after his death. So this is a really beautiful passage, and I'll tell you why. It's not from Leopold's, um, uh, you know, uh, thinking like a mountain. It's this guy, Bruce Babbitt. He's a politician, but he's a, a fierce conservationist, um, probably one of the best, last best pol political conservationists. Um, so Babbitt saying that, you know, basically Leopold and when he was younger and those guys, they wiped out wolves. They wiped out the gray wolf from Willis Will Yellowstone. They killed them. They were gone. They eradicated them. They were all but extinct. Depending on who you listen to, there were down to single or maybe double digit gray wolves in one area of the Yellowstone. Like you're talking about maybe a handful of wolves were left. Now, Leopold, of course, changed his mind, like we talked about, um, and, and then dedicated his life to conservation. And what's happening here is Bruce Babbitt is sort of reflecting on the amazing path of Leopold's life and thinking in his mind, it's like, I'm carrying a gray wolf back into Yellowstone where it was all but extinct um, as a result of these people who would kill them. And what's really weird and paradoxical is the person that's sort of responsible for that, Aldo Leopold, was the same person that was responsible for killing these wolves in the first place, but then he changed his mind. So Thinking Like a Mountain is part of this larger piece from 49 called the Sand County Almanac. Uh, and it basically is about, you know, having appreciation for the interconnectedness of the natural world. Uh, who is it written for? If we think of the audience, you know, audiences uh, for whom a text is written. Audience, it's not geared towards scientists or ecologists. In other words, Leopold wasn't writing for other Aldo Leopolds. He was writing for us, for everyday people. He was trying to make us understand uh, through an anecdote and a personal narrative how, you um, conservation looks and how ecology looks and how an ecosystem is so delicately balanced that you think you can wipe out wolves and nothing will happen. But in reality, something very terrible does happen. So it is more than anything else, just an anecdote. That's the literary technique of this. It's an anecdote piece, right? And he begins um, with, you know, the title itself, Thinking Like a Mountain. If you remember your terms from poetry, right, in high school, or maybe you took one this semester, but personification, which is, you know, remember giving human characteristics to non-human things. So just the idea of thinking like a mountain, right, that's personification. Mountains don't think. They're piles of dirt and, you know, sediment and other things. Uh, so, of course, they don't think. But, you know, metaphorically speaking, you know, they certainly do. And, and Aldo Leopold would argue that, uh, you know, metaphorically speaking, it's almost as much as human thought. So the term, the scientific term, and remember, he doesn't ever use this term. He never says trophic cascade. He never says that term in this piece. Uh, and the reason he doesn't say it is because it's not written for scientists. But if you were an ecologist, an environmental scientist, or scientist, or whatever, trophic cascade would make sense to you because the term basically is sort of the scientific term of um, the ripple effect that he then explains. You know that happens. So it's a cascade event, right? So you have essentially the wolf is killed, and we say you know he's showing us one wolf that's killed, but you have to multiply that by thousands upon thousands, right? So he tells us the story. If you followed what happens, basically he sees a deer. And he thinks it's sort of playing in the water. And then what he realizes is that like there's a wolf on its back, basically mauling it. And then a bunch of younger wolves come in and all he sees is like wolves just tearing this deer apart. Uh, they're mauling it. And then him and his other, um, you know, people that were, were being paid to kill and they're paid by the pelt. So every wolf pelt they brought, they got money. Um, you know, they just start sinking bullets into this giant you know, what we can think of just picture like a dozen wolves all eating a deer. So they're not really thinking about someone, you know, it's going to shoot them. And all of a sudden, these guys just start sinking bullets into that big crowd and they kill a lot of them. And he walks up and he says, I saw the fear screen glow in her eye, die out or whatever the term, whatever the uh, phrases I read. Uh, and, and that's like, he, he's, you know, something switches in his head. Even before he sees the result of what happens to killing all these wolves, there's something that changes in Aldo Leopold's mind when he sees this amazing, you know, creature just die at his hands. Even then, he sort of intuitively 
you know, we get the sense that he's like, yeah, this isn't right. Uh, so the wolf is killed and we had this cascade events. I don't want to go through it because that's what the reading sort of outlines. And that's, of course, what um, journal number two is all about. So journal number two, and I will uh, remind you where that is. So you just go on to Blackboard, um, you know, and you click on journal, nature journals, nature journal two, Aldo Leopold thinking like a mountain. So read Aldo Leopold's thinking like a mountain. You can get the PDF uh, through the journal. You can also listen to it if you want to have it read to you. Um, so read it and, and, you know, read it as you have it read to you. Uh, you can do that. There's, this is the audio version of it. Um, there's something, this version, I think I mentioned in the class, it has like a soundtrack behind it. It's a little weird, but it's actually pretty good. Uh, it, you know, there are studies, I don't want to get too far off topic, but there are tons of studies that show that reading. So if you have a problem with reading comprehension, which frankly, everyone does. People tell you they don't, but everyone has a problem with reading comprehension, maybe a little bit or a lot. But one of the tricks, if you want to sort of, um, you know, trick your brain or, or find a, uh, you know, like a way to trick your brain into making sure that it, it actually uh, ingests every word that you read, try to find an audio version of a text and read as you listen to it. There is something that happens when you do that. So this is more about a you know, reading comprehension and things, but um, it's worthwhile if you've never done it, or if you find yourself that if you're one of the people that, you know, you read a few sentences and all of a sudden you're like, wait a second, I just zoned out. I read a whole paragraph and I don't even know what I read. You know, it's, we do it when we drive. Sometimes you drive and all of a sudden you're like, whoa, I just drove like five miles and was in some other world. And I didn't even remember what happened. You know, that happens with reading sometimes. If you listen to it while you read it, it's a sort of short circuits your brain and you'll be able to comprehend it and retain it that's probably more important. So not just comprehend, but retain the information for longer. So the assignment, you're gonna to listen to uh, or read um, Leopold or listen to it and then answer these questions. Uh, what's the lesson being taught? Think like two or three sentences, discuss the cascade event. So the trophic cascade that he talks about, um, what is it, right? So it begins with the wolf population, then he talks about deer and other wolves, and then he talks about vegetation and the river and the air and then the mountain and all together. And uh, of course he's talking about this in this one geographical location, but imagine this, happening anywhere, right? We can pick this up and sort of superimpose it into any ecosystem on the planet and kind of see what Leopold is getting at, right? So think, we talked about this in the first day of class, this idea of always sort of thinking beyond the boundaries of what, what we're thinking, right? Thinking beyond the boundaries of what you're thinking. So yeah, he's talking about in the context of New Mexico and a gray wolf, and that's important. But this sort of practice, these, these practices of killing predators happened all over the world. And we saw these sorts of, you know, environmental changes happen everywhere. So don't get too caught up in Leopold's story. His is just a symbol for, uh, you know, tens of thousands of other similar stories that have occurred, you know, over hundreds of years. And of course, you know, the, for the ecological system to bounce back, it takes a lot. So uh, what's the lesson? Describe the sort of cascade of events. And then finally, last question, think of a time uh, where, you know, um, how this might relate to your own life. So can you think of something you did that had sort of an unintended consequence? Now, don't think of it, in, you can think of it in terms of environmentalism if you want, that's awesome, right? But what I'm trying to get you to do is think about this idea in a more general sense, how it might relate to you uh, and how really everything has a sort of cause and effect, right? They call it the butterfly effect. You've probably heard that before, the idea of a butterfly flaps, it, flaps its wings you know, across the ocean and it causes a hurricane on the other side of the planet. You might be like, how does a butterfly cause a hurricane? Well, that is trophic cascade. That's how it works. You know, things are so interconnected that yes, a butterfly does flap its wings. And when you, you know, it's not like it directly causes a hurricane across the world, but it is all part of the same system, right? So to some extent, the butterfly effect is, is not, you know, false. It, it does sort of represent the real system and the paradigm that we all function in. All right, so that's Aldo Leopold's Thinking Like a Mountain. Uh, the idea of this was, of course, to uh, just sort of introduce you to who Leopold is. But remember, this is all working towards reflection essay number two, which we'll focus on when we get back from break. Have a fantastic break, everyone. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing your thoughts or reading your thoughts on Aldo Leopold.